Thank you very much again, Joseph, for thank you, Charlie, for the interview. We're very glad to have you.、Uh, tell us about your background, where you grew up, and、uh, how did you come up? The, what did you do before you started the business? Yeah,、um, so I'm I'm born born and raised in Los Angeles, and um, um, my family's.、Uh, I, I guess I'll lead into our process. I can give you a little, you know, genesis for how our process started, how I became interested in the business. But um, yeah,、uh, my great grandfather immigrated to the United States from Croatia in the in the early 1900s and started farming on an acre of land in North Hollywood. And um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, so, so it's a family business. My family's been been farming in in Southern California for several generations. And my dad, who I work with, that, that was his first career、um, in that business. And、um, when he was in his late twenties, early thirties, he was、um, asked to serve on the board of a small regional bank called Santa Clarita National Bank. And、um, at the time, my family's business was that bank's largest client, so it made sense to the bank to to have board representation. And、uh, So it was a unique、uh, experience for my dad at a young age, and my dad,、uh, you know, he had a natural interest in investing, and and kind of got sad sidetracked in this family business, as 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 I said, as part of his first career. And he he joined the bank, and、um, the first couple of board meetings,、uh, he noticed that、uh, it, it was a public traded bank, but it was small and illiquid, so there wasn't a lot of float, and this is. You know, in the days before computers, so there was a board book every board meeting, and there was always a page of the board book dedicated to stock transactions. And he always noticed how every board meeting,、um, every stock transaction that had happened the prior quarter, it was always the chairman of the bank buying stock from whoever was selling. And he noted that no, noticed this, you know, quarter after quarter after quarter, and finally he sat there and and I think if you use common sense, he said, well, that's interesting. The chairman of the bank. Is buying stock ferociously. Any opportunity he has, maybe I should try to buy stock alongside of him. So, you know, he asked the chairman of the bank. The chairman of the bank allowed him to buy buy stock alongside of him. And you know, my dad put you know, basically his life savings into that stock in his in his early twenties. And you know, fast forward several quarters, and、um, uh, Santa Clarita National Bank ended up selling to First Pacific Bank, which was then、um, bought by Bank of America. And you know, in his mid thirties, my dad made made quite a bit of money. But I, you know, I think the lesson learned for him at that point was,、um, no matter how well you think you know a company, no matter how sound your analysis is,、um, you probably don't know as much as the people running that company.、Um, so you know, as a first principle, you know, in, in our process, we monitor every stock transaction by insiders. Um, we study the proxy as kind of a first document we look at, but、um, you know that lesson's really kind of ingrained in the DNA of this company, and it's you know watch what management does, and maybe that's the most intelligent、uh, you know screening mechanism. So I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but but to answer your question, so you know at at the time my dad you know he's still in the family business, but、uh, loves investing and has always invested in his own money, and.、Um, Uh, I went to the University of Southern California.、Um, I studied business and finance at USC, and I also played on the football team for the Trojans. And I was working out in the weight room、um, one day, and and the, the our director of football operations walked up to me and and said, "Hey, Joe,、uh, would you have any interest in in、uh, interning at Bear Stearns and Company?" And USC has a Is a great alumni network, and、um, we also have a very proud football tradition. So I was kind of afforded that opportunity early on, and this was during my sophomore year in college. But、um, you know, I interned at Bear Stearns.、Uh, I had two great mentors at Bear, one of which I'm still pretty close with today.、Um, but like I said, they were great mentors. They both taught me a lot about、um, the business,、mm-hmm. and I would say that was really what. You know, my first interest—that's—that's that's kind of what sparked the interest in me,、um, as it relates to the investment management business. And、um, you know, so dug in a little bit more, read a couple of books. It just so happened at that time, 
my dad, who was in the family business, had always kind of been chomping at the bit to be in the investment business. But when you're in your mid 40s, you know, like, well, what do you do? You be a junior stockbroker at Merrill Lynch in your in your mid 40s. Um, you can't do that. Uh, but the the individual that he had always worked with his entire life, and and he was a, a broker at that at that time at at Bear Stearns, and he approached my dad and said, "I'm leaving Bear Stearns and I'm starting my own money management business." Uh, you know, we've generated a lot of ideas together. Um, I have uh, great respect for, you know, your reput- reputation and the people that you know. And, you know, your family's been in L.A. since, you know, for 100 years. Uh, w- w- would you ever leave the family business and join me as my partner? And uh, my dad did. He did that midlife career change. And so, you know, after that experience at Bear Stearns for a couple of years, a year, uh, couple of years, um, kind of on and off, I worked at that at that kind of startup money management firm and uh you know learned a lot from my dad learned a lot from the other partners at that business and um you know just kind of got further entrenched in in investing and it was different than bear stearns in that this was more dedicated to actual stock picking and value investing and you know that's the field that i that i am in in, in today and then um yeah you know from there you just read you know the one thing about the investment management business and you guys know this but um i mean it's almost like it, it's like a fountain of knowledge and if you are interested in it, and if you are passionate about it there are so many great people that have you know come before us and already done uh, done this and put their thoughts and and the lessons learned in, in books and on paper and on interviews so you know warren buffett charlie munger bruce greenwald joel greenblatt seth Klarman. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And then studying business leaders that have run businesses from a John Malone to, you know, a Bill Sturitz, any of those guys profiled in the outsiders. And um, uh, there, there's just so much information out there. And, and if you really, um, if you really entrench yourself in, in, in all of that information, I mean, it's, it's, it's addictive. And, um, you know, so I, I really enjoy it. And, and like I said, I've had some great mentors and that's pretty key to, to kind of getting, getting to it. But, but you know, that, that was my introduction into the business. And, and, you know, so then we started this company in 2008 and I'm partners with my dad and we started it with two other partners and we built a great team and, and, uh, it, it is fun. Well, you know, we love what we do and, and, um, you know, hopefully over time our, our, our performance, uh, you know, shows that we're we're good at what we do. So basically, you you started with uh, you have four people, four people started the business, including you and mm-hmm. your dad. Yep. yep. Okay. How much money you were managing at the beginning? Is it only your money, your your own money, or some other people's money also? Yeah. So we so we launched fifteen uh, million in assets. It was you know mainly friends and family. Um, you know, like I said, my family's been in Los Angeles for a hundred years, and you know, my grandfather and, and both my dad are are you know honorable people and have lived their life the right way and treated people well. So they've you know, they've they've um, they have great reputations, and and like I said, we've been in Los Angeles for a hundred years, so you know, he's built up great relationships. So um, you know, we're lucky that a lot of people trusted us early on, and and, and like I said, we're able to. Uh, to launch with 15 million and and we've grown our business over time with um uh you know kind of built on those relationships that 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 we've built over a lifetime but then you know also we, we had some great performance the first five years and and uh, as as you guys know uh, good numbers will will attract assets so for the four people you started uh are are you all full-time or only some of you full time. Yeah, no, we're we're all full time. Um, but you didn't take salaries, I assume. Did you take salaries? Did you? Take- uh, very modest salaries, and, and and we were able to launch with some key, uh, you know seed capital from friends and family, so that helped a little bit. But uh, yeah, no, it was tough early on, and um, uh, you know the original four partners that launched it were not all, um, you know. Four still here. Me, my dad, and and my partner Chad are still here, and you know we we've had a few people join and leave along the way. And you know, one of the hardest things about any business, and and I really didn't know this until we started Old West, but you know getting the culture right is difficult. 
and it's taken a while, but you know, here we are 10 years into it. And I believe that today we have a great culture. Um, as I mentioned, three of the original partners are here a couple of years ago, a, a fourth partner jo joined us, Brian Lax, and he's been, he's, he's, you know, been great and, and really bought into what we do. And it's a big part of a big part of our company. So, yeah, I feel like we finally have the culture right, and um, I'm really excited about, you know, the next five to ten years. It's, it's funny, you know, early on you have conversations with allocators, and you, you hear, like, ten-year track record, ten-year track record. And I never really understood that at first. Like, why do you need a ten-year track record if you, you like the people in the process? And and now that we're ten years into it, I, I, I guess I kind of see what they, what, what why they want a ten-year track record, because it, it almost takes ten years to... And I get that culture right and have the dynamics right. So, we are actually very interested in the earlier years because I think the, that that was the most difficult years of any business. The earlier, the first five years, the first. Oh. Five. Yeah. So well, yeah. tell us more about that that part. The first five years, how how well, hard so, working you were, and how hard to get clients that time. Yeah. Well, so we, you know. The first five years are definitely uh, were definitely difficult and tough, but you know, for us, it was almost like the next five years were the hardest, just because of this, um, you know, the, the, the passive, active, and you know. So we started in two thousand eight. So in hindsight, you sit there and you go, "Well, you've had ten great years at your back, right? The market's just gone straight up, and and you know, to some extent, that that's right. But you know, if you're an active money manager," um, I, it's tough, you know. So I think the first, if you look at our first five years in business, um, you know, a court Morning Star, Investment Alliance, all the all the different databases that track performance. I mean, I I don't think our performance was top quartile the first five years. I think it was it was like top decile. We were you know top two or three percent in, in in every asset class that we manage. Performance was great. Um, as a result, we did raise assets, and you know, I think we probably got to 220 million uh, through our, our our first five years. You know, the last five years have been really difficult, though, and it hasn't been it hasn't been kind to active stock pickers. And um, you know, you you guys have have seen the data, and, and I know your listeners have have seen the data, but but um, you know, you've had trillions and trillions of dollars flow into passive index funds. And the indexes, they're all cap weighted. They're not equal weighted. So as $100 is invested in the index, it pushes the biggest names up higher. And, 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 and it, it's just, I think it's kind of a mania. And you've had a lot of smart people from Jeff Gunlack and Michael Burry. They've you know, talked about it recently. And, and you know, we'll see what happens. And you know, just yesterday, I don't know if you guys um, read the article. I think it was the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But it was... a uh, Twilight of the Stock Pickers was it was the title of, of of the article, and it talks about how for three straight years, you know, people have been redeeming uh, funds managed by active managers um, uh, in favor of, of of passive strategies, and um, so if you invested a hundred dollars in the S and P five hundred today, about twenty dollars. I think goes into the top ten names. All right. Thirteen cents goes into the bottom ten names, um, which is crazy. And and I actually remember in one in our one of our investor letters, I think it was our, our third quarter 2018 investor letter. Um, and and we you know we had the, the the market had the horrible fourth quarter, which gave back all the the gains. And I think the market finished down maybe six percent last year. But if you guys recall, through the end of the third quarter, the market was up about 10%. And we wrote in our investor letter how uh, the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500, so basically the FANG stocks, right? Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Netflix is a FANG, but it's not a top 10 stock. But um, if you took those top 10 stocks, um, over 100% of the year-to-date returns through the third quarter were in those top 10 stocks. So if you stripped out those top 10 stocks and you looked at the S&P 490, the market was negative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that, that's kind of been the story to a large extent the last, the last several years. So, you know, I, I you know, if you, if you just threw your money in the basket, you've done better. And, 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 and the funny thing, 
you know, so what does an active manager do, right? So an active manager, um, you know, they're digging through the corporate filings, staying up until 2 a.m. reading a 10K, getting to know the management teams. So I, I think, you know, if you use common sense, and, and, and I think, you know, in life in general, right, right? In 2008, when you had the financial blow up, a lot of things just didn't make sense and people kept on doing them. And so, so I think in, in the end, reality um, has to come back to earth. And, and I just think there's a, there's a lot of things that don't make sense right now. And it doesn't make sense that someone that is diligent in their work um, is underperforming, uh, you know, just kind of throw the dart at the dartboard. And so, anyways, the, the whole point of this, what I'm saying is the last five years has been tough because um, if you haven't owned the FANG stocks, which we haven't, um, you, you, you've underperformed. So... So the first five years were tough because we were starting a business, and the second five years have been tough because we've been, you know, fighting against the, the, this tide of, of, of passive managers. And, um, you know, as you know, it seems like there's a new fund that goes out of business every day. Um, but I'm convinced that just like in any downturn, um, the people that are able to, you know, keep their head down and, and work hard and, and do what they're doing um, when, when the tide turns – uh, you know, we'll look at the investment business today. Who are the great investment managers that we all think of as the best? They're all the guys that in 1999 and 2000, when you know the market blew up, they did great. And I'm not predicting that the market's going to blow up, but you know, we I, I could easily see a scenario where the market just kind of flat for a 10 year period. Well, if you're a manager and you could be you know 10 percent, 12 percent, 15 percent annualized over that 10 year period. Um, you know, so, so anyways, I, I'm, I'm excited about our next 10, next 10 years. And, and the, yeah, but the, the first 10 years has been fun. Um, I've enjoyed building this business. I've been, you know, enjoyed being with my partners. I've, I've enjoyed working with my dad. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's definitely been challenging. So, so I'm excited, excited for the future. The question is: Are you are you losing any clients in the last five years due to the passive, due to you underperformed the passive inv investment? Did you? Uh, yeah, so we have lost clients, um, but we've also gained a few clients. Okay. Um, if you look, if you look at our total assets under management, we haven't lost uh, a lot of assets, and that's really a testament to to our clients and the type of people we've built our business with and. Um, you know, most of these managers that I talk about that have gone out of business, they, you know, they, their business was really built on um, institutional allocations, right? And, and, you know, a lot of the institutional world, if you, you know, underperform for 20, you know, 12 months, you're on, you're on the uh, watch list. And if you underperform for 18 months, you're, 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 you're toast. Um, we have a lot of great clients and, and um, you know, they, they are with us, uh, you know, because of our process and the names that we we own and you know we write quarterly letters and we try to be very transparent and talk about our names in the letters so you know i i um we're blessed with great clients how uh, tell us how hard you work well you know so it's funny the, the one thing about the investment one thing about the investment management business um you know a lot of jobs you you go home at the end of the day and, and you, know, you, you, you punch a time clock, right? And when, when you punch out, you're done and, and um, you're on to other things. And, you know, this is a business where you really never, you really never stop working. You never, you never stop reading. You never stop thinking about your investments. You never stop. Um, it's just, it's almost like you're working 24 seven and, and, and uh, you know, it, it in the, in the investment management business, it, it, it's more of a lifestyle than a business, right? It's, it's you, you live your work, and um, it doesn't always make you the most balanced person, but, you know, that, that's why you have to love what you do. If you don't love what you do, you, this isn't the business for you. Absolutely. So you did mention that the, those first five years, you had some pretty early success. What would you say were some of the things you did right during that time? Yeah. Um, you know, I think our, well, first off, I think when you, 
you know, you start a company, you, what's your process? What's your investment strategy? And, you know, I think that we have a pretty clear, crystal clear investment strategy. And, you know, it's two pronged. I will, well, first off, I would say our, our, our process, I just think it makes a lot of common sense. You know, I've, I've heard many people, you know, say, hey, I met, you know, I met with this, this financial advisor or money manager and they explained what they do and they put all these charts up and I didn't really understand it, but they sounded smart and, and, um, I, I, I think that's tough, right? I mean, I mean, if 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 you're, you know, if you're a momentum investor, or if you're just gonna, you know, invest in a a basket of stocks, or if you're gonna, you know, be a a technician, I I just think it's all it's all about performance. But when you have, you know, a, a sound, thoughtful investment process that people can understand, and you know, and 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 as I said earlier, you know, we as a as a as a first principle. We want to only invest in companies where management is aligned with us as investors. Um, so we look for, so typically how we would screen for ideas, and a name could come into our, our focus in a number of ways, but every day, and we've been doing this for 20 years, um, we go, my dad actually does this, and he's been doing this, I think, for 30 years, but, you know, we go through every SEC Form 4 filing from the day before. So if we see a CEO, a director, CFO, someone, someone that's part of management, you know, write a check buying $5 million of stock with their own after ta tax capital. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to go buy alongside of them. Um, but if that CEO thinks a $5 million investment in, in, into his own company where he in theory knows more about that company than anyone else is a good decision. Um, we're going to dig in. We're going to print out the proxy, and we're going to try to see if we could see what he does. And and the same, you know, we we closely watch 13D filings. Um, there, you know, are probably 20 or 30 different investors that we have a high regard for, and we respect the work that they do. And we look at their 13F filings uh, on a quarterly basis. And once again, it doesn't mean that they're right, and we're going to go. Um, follow them into that investment, but we know how hard they work. We understand their process. We have such a high regard for them um, that, yeah, we're going to spend, you know, at a minimum, you know, a couple of hours trying to dive in and see if we can see what they do. And I think that that is probably the most intelligent starting point versus, you know, reading some sell-side sell research report or, you know, reading the Wall Street Journal or Barron's on the weekend, um, look at what people are doing with their own money. So I would say that's kind of, you know, and, and then from there, the first document we typically w would look at is the proxy statement. And as, as your listeners know, the proxy statement is going to detail stock ownership, compensation. And I would say, you know, what's important to us is what metrics are compensation tied to? Are they shareholder friendly metrics? And, um, so, so that would kind of be prong one of the research process, and prong two would be, you know, at, at our core, we're value investors, and we don't want to to overpay for businesses. And, um, you, you know, with that said, uh, cheap businesses are cheap usually for a reason, and and so we try to to you know to identify you know some hard hard or soft catalyst that 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 will unlock that that value and and, and make the stock appreciate at the end of the day. Um, but you know. Anyways, to get back to your question, I think that process is a, it, it, it's thoughtful, it, it, it's it's full of common sense, and I think um, you know when you express that to your clients, and when you, as I said, I, anybody that, that that has an interest, they could go to our website and read all of our quarterly letters, and in each quarterly letter, um, we talk about at least. Uh, one of our holdings, and and at times we we you know discuss that holding in depth. And I think if you you know if you go through and read our last couple of years quarterly letters, I mean you're basically reading seventy five percent of the of the fund. And um, you know, so I I think that that clarity um, is appreciated by our clients, and I think you know separates us. And and there's a lot of fund managers out there that 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 do what we do. Um, 
and and you know those guys. So I so I think people that are in the investment management business can identify those managers. But to to the general public, it's 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 a dying breed. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, no, you know, studying a company and 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 investing in a company where you know management is making smart capital allocation decisions and that's it, it, like. Who, who does that anymore, right? So, so anyways, it's it's fun. Actually, just by the way, you on Guru Focus, you can use our insider data to set up alerts. If there's some new new CEO buys, big CEO buys, you can get an email alerts for that. You don't have to go yeah. through every one of them yourself. No, yeah, Guru Focus, and actually, when um, Charlie, when you reached out and invited me to speak at the the conference this year. I mean, it was, I, I was very honored because Guru Focus is a it's a database and a resource um, you know that I I've, I've known of and and have looked to for uh, you know a, a, a long long time. So so having you guys reach out to me was kind of uh, it, was a, it was an honor. Thank you, definitely. Um, so obviously, there's we've talked about a lot of success along the way, a lot of happy moments. Do you feel anywhere yeah. along those lines um, you've made any mistakes that you know, looking in hindsight, you wish you could go back and fix, or um, things about the business that you wish you could change that you don't like at this point in time? Oh, I mean, we've made ton of tons of mistakes right and and i mean i mean get, getting back to the you know allocator saying 10 year track record it's like i i get it right because you make a lot of mistakes in the in the first 10 years and um you know like i said with our culture i think we you know we probably had had hired people at times that we should have never hired and and you know anyways we, we've gotten that right our culture is great um you know you learn a lot of lessons too, and in, 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 one of the great things about the investment management business is it's one of the few businesses where, in theory, um, uh, you only get better and better. I mean, uh, until you until you you know dementia starts hitting it. But um, yeah, I mean, you could argue that you know Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are better today than they've ever been, and you know here they are in their nineties. So, so you know, the great investors. I mean, all, all make mistakes, um, but it's it, you know what do you do with m- those mistakes and and how do you learn from it? And yeah, I mean we, we we made plenty of mistakes on the investing side. I um you know we, we kind of got hit in 2014 when when en- the, the energy price you know energy collapse and wh- whatever oil, oil fell from what was it, like a hundred bucks to thirty bucks and you know we owned a couple of of um, Really good companies run by owner managers, um, but a couple a couple of those companies had too much debt, and and like that, that was a big lesson. I will, um, I don't think I will ever have any interest in owning a commodity company that has has too much leverage. I I, I think I'm, you hear a lot of value investors say I'm not going to own you know commodities because, um, you know, the the price of the commodity is unknowable and. It, and I understand that, but but I you know where I disagree is I think that a lot of money could be made in commodities, but you know I think the key to invest in commodities is 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 um, pay close attention to debt, right? Because a good company uh, could could come out of a downturn stronger than ever before if if debt doesn't sink them before. So you know we we got hurt with a couple of companies there. Um, you know, we've owned a couple, a couple of companies that we bought because we felt that they were, um, uh, represented, uh, great value, you know, value situations, some of the part analysis, um, you know, but once again, I think where I've, you know, where I've, where we've evolved as investors is I, I don't know that you, I would ever have any interest again in owning a company that is not at least, uh, stable or slightly growing when you look at revenue because if 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 that business is in decline and it's a sum of the part story it doesn't matter how cheap it is because it, it the clock's ticking so if that value doesn't get unlocked you know whatever over the next year or two years um it's no longer cheap so you know i, I don't know that i 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I think you know, investing's hard enough. Why own a business that's where there's not where it's not a secular growth story? Why buy a business in decline because it's cheap? Because, like I said, now now the clock's ticking, right? So, so yeah. I mean, you, you learn a, a ton of lessons, a ton of lessons. But but it's you know it's been fun and. Thankful, thankful, thankfully, we've made more good decisions than bad decisions, and and uh, you know I look at where we are today, and and I, I just think we're we're positioned perfectly. Um, you know, we're managing, like I said, around two hundred million. Um, we, you know, I don't know how long this this passive mania continues, but um, it can't continue indefinitely. So I think to to be where we are. Um, Kind of at the when when the the passive mania or the market kind of seems you know frothy. I just think we're in, we're in a great spot. So very excited about about our future. You mentioned that you hired someone that you you wish you didn't hire. So now, if you hire today, what kind of people will you hire? Well, so so I actually would love to grow our team.、Um, I think we need to to, to to get a little bigger in terms of you know assets, but、um, we one of the best decisions I, I I think we ever we have we we've made. You talk about making what are good decisions that you've made, but about four years ago, five years ago, we started an intern program, and、um, you know these weren't interns like me. If you I I interned at Bear Stearns. Well, I when I went to go intern at Bear Stearns, I did not know much at all about the investing business. But you know, Bear Stearns was a big company, and they had people dedicated full time to that intern program and setting up lunches and introducing you to business leaders.、Um, so that was a great experience for me.、Um, although there are tons of young people that、uh, can be enriched with that sort of you know opportunity, we're a small company. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time to dedicate just to an intern program. So,、um, you know, several years ago, we uh, uh,、um, put a you know this intern posting with a, a group at USC, the, the, the USC Value Investment Group.、Um, so what's crazy is you know these these kids are all freshmen and sophomores,、um, but they're <laughs> remember. The first guy、uh, that we had, he came in. He came and interviewed, and I gave him a, a list of what I thought were, some, you know, the, the five, you know, best investing books for, you know, for someone young to learn. And、um, you know, I, I I read all five. He goes, "Have you read these three?" And it's like, and I was like, "Holy cow!" No, well, no, I haven't read those three. And、um, but、uh, he, this this kid had such, you know, incredible passion. And anyways, he came in and interned for us. That was his freshman year.、And、then after that, he went to go work, and he worked at、uh, Harris Associates in Chicago. Then after that, he went and he interned at Value Act in San Francisco. And now he's working full time at、um, uh, a money management firm.、Uh, uh, I can't think of it, but a, a famous one here in, in Los Angeles. But、um, Yeah, so it started with him, and there were two other kids, and and then you know those three interns, they、um, you know they recommended, they they basically did the interviewing and, and picked our interns the following year, but、um, we you know year in and year out,、um, we we've had this intern program, and and it's evolved, and now I think there's you know twelve or fifteen kids that have now interned for us, and you know. Passionate about the business, very smart, love value investing. A lot of them have now, you know, have, have careers in this business.、Um, so I, I, I think, you know, if we were to build a bigger investment team, I would, I would hire several of those kids. They're kind of, you know, hire right out of that, that, that investment team. You know, so I look. I think you always need to.、Um, Be cautious that that you know maybe you're not right. You don't have all the answers. Maybe there's another、um, you know way or strategy of making money. Clearly there are because investors have made money a lot of different ways. But but um you know one of the great things with bringing these kids in early on is I I, I think you know there's a few tenets of our our philosophy such as you know owner managers 
only look at companies where management owns a lot of stock. You know, so there's a few principles that we hold near and dear that, that um, you know, someone else wouldn't pay a lot of credence to. And I just think that that's, um, you know, for us to, to, to look at an investment, it needs to meet certain criteria. Mm-hmm. So looking at new people, you mentioned you'd love to expand in the future. Are there any future plans for expansion currently in process or anything you're really excited about moving forward at this point in time? Yeah, you know, I mean, not really. You know, I, we have a great team today. We have a four-person in, uh, investment team. Um, you know, I, I, I think we're perfectly, you know, positioned to, to you know, manage a lot more than we're currently managing and, and grow and get a lot bigger than we currently are with, with you know, the, the team currently in place. But, yeah, I, I you know, look, I, I think... It, there's a lot of, you know, great analysts, um, a lot of great people on the investment side that we would we would love to talk to. But I think you know that's also a function of um, resources, and and I think we would have to you know be bigger before we really thought about building out our team. For sure, and at this point, do you find that there are any? I guess, risk factors or threats that you see in the industry that could affect you guys moving into the future, or are you feeling pretty confident where you're sitting right now? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think uh, passive investing, right? Passive investing in algorithms. I think that's that's clearly a, you know, a threat to the active management industry. And, and um, you know, I, I, I think it's a mania. I think it's a bubble. I don't think it could go on for, for that much longer, but... I've been saying that for a while. So, um, you know, the one thing that I've learned is, um, so we have the ability to short uh, in our our strategies. Um, and thankfully, uh, you know, we've always been net long and haven't had a lot of short exposure, but we've had bigger short exposure than we do today. And we've gotten hurt. We've gotten hurt badly on the short side. And, um, you know, I used to think very bottom up and I still think bottom up. I think you need to think bottom up, but I didn't really spend any time thinking about top down. And the problem with that is, is, you know, in this environment that we live in. So, so first of all, we talk about the market, right? The market being high and this, this index fund mania. Well, I believe the only reason the market's here, the only reason that we have, it's all central bank debauchery and manipulation. 0% 0% interest rates, $15 trillion worldwide of, you know, negative interest rates. So what does that do? That just, that that pushes money into riskier assets, real estate, stock market, all-time, you know, cap rates are at all-time lows, PE multiples that are all-time highs. But I but I think that's a, that is a derivative of, of central bank manipulation. So my point is, you know, being short the last couple of years, I think we've been dead on uh, in terms of our our um, you know thesis and the way we're thinking about things. But you know, when you're short a company and um, you know that company has access to basically free capital and you know could issue equity and in normal times that company wouldn't be able to issue equity and. You, know, you talk about the IPO market and all these unicorns, and even though you start seeing that market crack a little bit, um, that's all been driven by by easy money policies. So, you know, I I think um, I talk about you know right the market being expensive. Don't know how much longer this could go on, but you know I also think that the that that the uh, Fed is going to continue doing whatever they can to keep this going, and you know. Ultimately, the uh, the longer it goes on, the, the the bigger the bust will be. But I mean, is that tomorrow? Is that three years from now? So, you know. So, anyways, with that thinking, our our short exposure is less than it's probably ever been. Most of our uh, protection on the portfolio, um, you know, is done with uh, you know deep out of the money put options to where very little capital is at risk, but. Um, you know, if we're right and if it's significant, it'll it'll pay off in a big way. And, uh, you know, once again, just really focus on the long side on building the portfolio from a bottom-up basis. 
And, um, you know, I, like I said, we've underperformed the, 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 the index funds over the last couple of years. But, but, you know, in theory, even if this continues, we should be able to outperform with some of the names in the portfolio um, as they work. Um, just, we're just waiting for them to work. Does that keep you up at night? Or is there, is there something to, that keeps you up at night? Oh, yeah. Well, I, every single one of the stock holdings in our portfolio that I am responsible for, every single one of them keeps me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> so. For sure. Um, so, obviously, you're, you're you're not the sole owner of the business. You are in a partnership. But mm -hmm. down the road, if y'all had the the success at this burst that you think might happen and somebody approached you with a ludicrous offer, would you consider handing over the business or you want to keep your hands at the reins for the foreseeable future? Well... So, you know, five years ago, I would say for sure, keep our, you know, hands on the rein forever. Um, uh, I, and that's still my answer. I just, um, like I said, the, you know, the last five years, um, it, it's just been an interesting time, right? Because you, you feel like you're doing a lot of things the right way, but it doesn't matter. Um, and, and, uh, you know. I don't know. It, it's I uh, one of the the kind of the, the the owner owner managers, capital allocators that that we follow, and um, we own a lot of we own his holding company and a lot of a lot of the spinoffs in the portfolio is you know his, his name's Howard Jonas, and uh, he had a, I read an article a while ago, and 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 you know they the question was kind of you know what's keep kept you grounded with all this you know success you've had and he's had several billion dollar exits and he anyways basically what he says he goes look i've i've learned in life that um he didn't say it exactly this way but 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 basically what he said is um you know being good at what you do being smart at what you do working hard at what you do that's that's like the ticket of admission that gets you on the playing field you know, and then from there, he said, you know, don't underestimate the role that luck plays. And, um, you know, so I, I, I think about that, right? And, you know, don't underestimate the role that luck plays. And, you know, and, and sometimes people that work hard and are right are just unlucky. And maybe, you know, they were right, but it happens two years later and they're not in business anymore. So, so you know, I... I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You, you, you'd have to, to weigh the situation. But, um, you know, the one thing that I can tell you is we love what we do and there's nothing else we'd rather be doing. So, um, you know, I don't know that I, I would want to work for someone else. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, on a more... I guess, future looking note for some of our listeners and anybody yeah. out there looking to, to make something happen with their life, what would be some of your key points of advice for getting a business up and running, you know, kind of from the ground up? Yeah, well, so I'd say, you know, in the investment, but clearly, you know, you need to get the business side right. Um, but there's all sorts of service providers that you can surround yourself with. But I... I would say, you know, in terms of learning the business and learning investing, like I said earlier, it's it's a, there's a there's like a, a Trevor Trevor treasure treasure trove of resources out there, you know. And one of my my past partners, when people would reach out to him and you know be looking for a job or an internship, he would. Um, I, I told you I gave this guy a, a list of five books, and and I learned that from one of my previous partners, but he would. You know, give these people that call the list of five books to learn, and he'd say, um, you know, once you've read these five books, give me a call. He said, you know, 90, 98 percent of the people never call you. You know, it's just it's 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 not that easy to read a book, right? And it's not that easy to read a book if you're not passionate about the content in that book. So, you know, I, I, I'd say there there's a treasure trove of of stuff out there, and there's a lot of great owner managers, and business leaders, and investors, and visionaries. Um, 
I mean, you could, uh, it's almost like you can get your MBA and CFA and doctorate and investing just from, you know, we have a reading our bookshelf out there. So definitely in, you know, when you're feeling stuck at any point in time, is there any particular people or books like you mentioned in particular that you like to look for, for inspiration to, you know, bring that motivation back to you? Um, so there's a great coffee table book we have in our office. It's called the, the great minds of value investing. It's written by William Green. And in the book, William Green, he profiles, I think like, you know, 50 value who he thinks are the 50 best value investors. And it's great. You know, as you go through, um, uh, those profiles, um, a lot of the, the stories are, are kind of the same. And the two that stuck out to me was there was one with uh, one profile on, on Jean-Marie Valier who ran First Eagle. And there was another profile on Donald Yakman. And both of these guys, I mean, it was almost like the same story, but, you know, they were managing money like in 97 or 98. I'm not going to say the wrong numbers, but it's something like Donald Yakman was running a billion dollars in like 96. And by 1999, he was running under, um, he was running less than $100 million. And he was just, you know, depression, um, you know, just, you know, felt stupid, didn't know what he was doing. Am I doing the right thing? And, and um, anyways, you know, fast forward, 2000 happens today, you know, Yakman's managing $30 billion. And, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I like to read kind of those, you know, on, on certain days where it's like, gosh, man, the market's up 20%. This is crazy. But um, yeah, so. A lot of inspiration out there. For sure, for sure. And at this point in time, you know, what are you most grateful for in your life? Is it the business, personal? What are the good things going for you? Yeah, I would say, well, I'd, I'd say my, my faith, my family, and our business. Um, you know, th- th- those three things. And I think if you're if you're strong in the first two, the the third will, you know, take care of itself. But I think, yeah. You know, if your priorities are right and, and uh, you know, on the business side, if you're doing the right thing and keeping your head down and, you know, and working hard and constant, constantly, you know, checking your blind spots, um, I think you'll be okay. I think, uh, you know, that's, um, yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm excited and, and, and happy about everything that's currently going on and, Looking, looking forward to the future. Definitely. And on a more personal note for us here and what we're doing on this side of things, is there anybody we should look to in the future to reach out to, speak with? Anybody you think would be a good candidate for one of these interviews? Oh, gosh. I mean, I mean, there's, you know, the thing that I probably hold, you know, nearest and dearest to me in, in, in my business would be, um, you know, just, just my network that I've built up. And, and when I say, you know, network, I don't mean clients. I mean, other people that do what I do. And, um, I, yeah, I mean, I'll, we'll talk offline. I'll, I'll give you a bunch of names. You probably know a lot of them, but there, there are so many, um, people that are, 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 you know, passionate about this business and good at what they do. And, um, you know, I, I would say that I just, you know, hope, you know, for, for, for these investors that they're just able to attract the investor base that, that, that we do, because I think, you know, the, the only thing that, that sidetracks a lot of people is just not having the, the patient capital to enable, enable you to, to enact your investment discipline. Yeah, actually, not just the investment business. We're also interested in interviewing other businesses, not just limited to the investment business. Well, who you should interview, and I, I don't know if you, uh, if you'd be open to being interviewed, but but I know you, you know you profile a lot of great um, business leaders and capital allocators, and you know, like I said, that's a big uh, a big part of our process. And I, I've said this before, but you know, ima- imagine. Had you identified John Malone as a as a great business allocator, as a great capital allocator and, and business visionary thirty years ago, invested alongside of him, ex, ex, alongside of him? How have you done? <laughs> right, you've done really well. 
imagine how you, you know, how do you identify Warren Buffett 50 years ago and invested alongside of him? You've done great. So, you know, one person that I, I talk a lot about and we, you know, I identified him as a kind of a visionary and great capital allocator um, several years ago as a gentleman by the name of Howard Jonas. And Howard Jonas, um, he's very, uh, very apparent in our portfolio. I think our, our Howard Jonas basket, as I call it, is probably a 12% position in our portfolio. But he started a, a telecom company in 1990 called IDT Corporation. Yeah, I know that. And they, yeah, and they, they kind of pioneered the international callback business. So, so basically, they had a technology that could cut long distance bills, um, you know, by 80%. And um, I, he's done a great job building that business. That business does a billion and five in revenue today. Um, but it's a business that is in structural decline. Um, you know, you have free VoIP providers like Skype and like WhatsApp. And as those new technologies that put pressure on the international minutes business, uh, they've done a great job at, at kind of running that business lean and taking the cash that that business generates and buying a basket of growth initiatives. And if you just look at the last 10 years, starting in 2010, so since 2010, he has spun off five different businesses from IDT Corporation and sold a sixth. But if you invested in IDT Corporation in 1990, you've made like 50% per year for the last 10 years versus the S&P, which, which is up 10%. So. You know, we have a stake in IDT Corporation, and although that business is, is, you know, under pressure, they still have two growth initiatives within that business. They have a, a UCAS initiative called Net2 Phone, and they have a, a point of sales business called National Retail Solutions. So, so anyways, I, I don't know where I, I, I left off, but, but uh, so, so, you know, Howard Jonas, and, you know, so we own IDT Corporation, which still has two growth initiatives within it, but... We own um, each of the spins. So we own, he spun off a company called IDW in 2009. He spun off Zedge in 2017 and Raphael in 2018. And we own all three businesses. Uh, the, the business that I didn't mention was Straight Path Communications, which was sold. But um, uh, it's a good story and, and, and kind of demonstrates, you know, his vision. And I think most importantly, his ability to be patient. But you know, in 2001, when Winstar Communications went bankrupt, um, I think Howard, you know, he identified the, the future of Spectrum and airwave licenses and, and, and what a big business that would be, become. So when Winstar Communications went bankrupt in 2001, um, he bought a hodgepodge of Spectrum licenses um, from Winstar out of bankruptcy for $50 million. And he's kind of held that asset um, all this time. And then 2011, I think he spun off that hodgepodge of Spectrum licenses as a company called Straight Path Communications. And he sold that, that business last year to Verizon for $3.1 billion, and he owned 20% of the company. So that was a, you know, a pretty nice exit for him. But um, you know, definitely someone that, that uh, has an amazing capital allocation track record. He has multi, uh, several billion dollar exits. And and um, you know someone that we've we've followed closely. Um, but anyways, he'd be a great guy to interview if I could. Uh, if I could, um, I'll, I'll. I mean, if you're interested, well, maybe he'd talk. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you yeah. can make great. an introduction for us, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I will. All righty. Well, for our side of things and our purposes, that'll round out our questions that we got at this point in time. So I know I speak for myself and absolutely Charlie as well. We were really appreciative of having you on the show today. We really, really did have a good time talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, no. As as did I. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much. See you you next year. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. You got it. Bye. Absolutely.